Okay. So welcome everyone. We'll just begin in prayer and then we'll go into the presentations. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for enabling us to gather um, as brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to look at your work uh, in our midst and uh, Lord, what you have done in the past, to be inspired by how you have moved, how people have followed you um, faithfully and sacrificed so much, Lord, for your namesake, for your kingdom, and how their sacrifice has impacted us. Uh, we pray as we um, present, as uh, some of the students present, Lord, that you would uh, ignite within our hearts a uh, passion for you, Lord, a uh, fire um, that will um that will spark something uh, within us and through us lord for your name's sake for your kingdom's sake uh, we pray blessings over um every aspect of this class and even as uh, people are trying to set up and use um use their laptops be able to present lord that you would work through all of those things to bless our time together in jesus name we pray amen Okay, so we, um, Rin, shall we begin with Anthony then? Or are you ready? Yeah, Pastor. Please begin with Anthony. Okay, sure. Uh, Anthony, you can go ahead. Uh, Anthony, are you hello? Ready? Yeah. Um, yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, about to share my screen. Uh, Anthony, there's a, uh, some yes. noise I'm in the there. background. Um, okay. So, if it's possible for you to kind of move to some somewhere where it would be quieter, so it would be a little easier for us to hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we're able to see your screen. Um, if you're able to switch on your uh, video, then uh, please okay. do that. But if, if right. it's difficult for you to do that... Uh, no. Okay. okay. Can you hear? I'm from Nigeria. I will be doing a presentation yes. on a great evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. He was born in Bradford, England in 1859. He had a caring father and mother, and a Christian grandmother who molded his mind and spirit. His grandmother was an old-time Wesleyan Methodist who would take him to all the meetings she attended at the age of seven. He and his brother worked in a woolen mill. His father also worked in the same mill as a weaver. When Smith was 13, he moved to Bradford. There, he went to a Wesleyan Methodist church and began to enter into a deeper spiritual life at age 16. Uh, sorry, Anthony, can you unmute yourself? We just uh, missed a part of it. Uh, if you can unmute, uh, we are not able to hear the sound.
yeah if you can go back a bit we heard just the start but uh, lost uh, the sound in between sorry uh, okay, I, can you hear me now? yes can we I can hear you mind? yes just a little bit it it was playing fine uh, but uh, uh, somewhere just a few seconds back it we were not able to hear okay let me take it back uh Okay, Anthony, you can play right from the start. I think uh, Prince has requested uh, that you start from the beginning. Would you be able okay. to start presenting from the start? Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. Hi, my name is Anthony Solomon. I'm from Nigeria. I will be doing a presentation on a great evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. He was born in Britain. Hi. My I think you need to share your screen again, Anthony. Uh, we're not able, yes. we were able to hear, but we couldn't see yet. All right. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. OK. What about now? Yes, we're able to see it. Okay. My name is Anthony Solomon. I'm from Nigeria. I will be doing on a great evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. He was born in Bradford, England in 1859. He had a caring father and mother and a Christian grandmother who molded his mind and spirit. His grandmother was an old-time Wesleyan Methodist who would take him to all the meetings she attended at the age of seven. He and his brother worked in a woolen mill. His father also worked in the same mill as a weaver. When Smith was 13, he moved to Bradford. There, he went to a Wesleyan Methodist church and began to enter into a deeper spiritual life. At age 16, he joined the Salvation Army in Bradford. He fasted and prayed for the salvation of souls in those days, and every week he saw scores of sinners yielding their heart to Christ. When Smith was 20, he moved to Liverpool, and the power of God was mighty upon him. He had a great desire to help the young people. Every week, he will gather some scores of boys and girls, barefooted, ragged, and hungry, with the money he earned, he will end up spending the money on food for all the children. This was his first ministry, and he brought hundreds of them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Love, marriage, and ministry of Smith Wigglesworth. He got married to Mary Featherstone in 1882, whom he met in the Salvation Army when he moved to Bradford. Together, they have five children, four boys and a girl who all entered ministry when they grew up. Prayer and healing ministry of Smith Wigglesworth. Smith believed in the power of the name of Jesus. He prayed and fasted frequently and surrounded himself with people that he knew loved to pray. He also believed in the use of the anointing oil and many were healed instantly when he anointed them. Smith and his wife had a pact where they did not allow any medicine in their house as they preferred to trust in God for their healing needs. This faith was tested when Smith fell in and despite much prayer and intercession, 
healing seemed elusive. He left it up to his wife to decide what to do. And so, fearing for the life of her husband and what the authorities may say, if no doctor was called, she called for the doctor. When the doctor examined him, the doctor shook his head and said there is no hope. He had appendicitis for the past six months. The doctor declared Smith as good as a corpse and said that he could not do anything to help heal him. A praying woman and another young man, however, came along and fervently prayed for him. Smith was healed in that moment and rose up, dressed up, and went out to work. Later recounting the incident, Smith said, Well, the corpse has been going up and down the world, preaching the gospel many years since that time. The legacy of Smith Wigglesworth. By his faith, Smith Wigglesworth was known as the great apostle of faith, laid the foundation for the growth of the Holy Spirit in the modern church. The miracles that he performed were long lasting as evidenced by the testimonies of numerous persons whose lives he touched and a lot of people were drawn to Christ through his healing and prayer ministry. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Anthony. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. That was my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Anthony. It looks like you put in a lot of hard work. Uh, so we're not going in the same order as uh, we have in our textbook because today we'll just do all the presentations. Uh, but we can go to Rin next if you're ready, Rin. Thank you. Then we can't hear you. Uh, I think your mic is muted, Rin. Okay. Your voice is a bit unclear. Um, are you using your laptop or? I would speak here. Yeah. Fasa, is it clear now? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Okay, then, no. It should. It should. How do you maximize it? I can do this slideshow. You can do this slideshow. Maximize it. Minimize you mean? And... Yeah. I need to see the world.
Uh, Jin, do you need that Word document that you had sent to me? Yes, Pastor. Are you able to open it on um, Sri Radha's system or? Or on your phone or something, I can send it to you if you need me to. Ma'am, can you tell to other person? I'll I'll instruct her. Can you give to other person? Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Um, I think we had. Uh, sorry. I think we have Ravli next. If Ravli is ready. If Ravli is not, then uh, we can go to Shiv Kumar. Um, Rin, you can maybe uh, stop sharing. And then Shiv Kumar, are you ready to present now? OK, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Nikhil, why don't you go ahead, and then we'll just check what everyone answers. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. OK. OK, uh, so greetings, everyone. And uh, so today uh, I'm, I'm going to explain about Pandita Ramabai. So uh, ma'am, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we are able to hear. Okay. So, Pandita Ramabai, uh, she was the missionary of India as uh, she was born April 23rd, 1858, Kendra, Madras, and she died 5th April 1922, Bombay residence. Uh, uh, about introduction, her life, born in the second half of the year. 1800 into a half ranking Hindu family. She became a pioneer of women's rights in her country. Ramabai Pandita, born on April 23rd, 1858, into a very conservative society. Ramabai Dongre. Dongre was her family name. Madhvi, her married name, was born into a high caste Hindu family because of 
her looks and appearance she was adored as goddess when she arrived in kolkata at age 20 and uh, her family uh, she was the daughter of a wealthy brahmin sanskrit scholar her father was a wandering professional reciter of hindu epic and mythologic logical text after her parents death in the 1874 famine she and her brother continued the family tradition in june 1880 married a man of much lower caste than hers her only child uh, manonrama her child manonrama was born in april 1881 less than a year later her husband died of cholera leaving her in the painful situation of high caste hindu high caste her daughter manorma and she died in 1921 mama by herself died the following years so uh, about uh, her spiritual journey and uh, that can you can so the name so uh, about her spiritual journey after her parents death in the 1874 famine she went she went to calcutta and at the title of pandita saraswati were bestowed on her as acknowledgement of her learning uh, her as an acknowledgement of her learning she joined the bravo samaj a reformation hindus association through the influence of nehemia gorais apologetic writings the became intellectually convinced that wherever was true in the brahmo theology was actually christian she was baptized uh, sorry uh, nikhil can you just check that mic it's um, it's suddenly going it's echoing a bit in between so it's a little bit difficult to follow can you just check i don't know the connection is loose or Hello, ma'am. Now you can hear me. Ah, uh, yes, it's fine. So you can just start from the beginning of this slide. I think there was some problem when you started this. Okay, ma'am. Sure. Ah, uh, this was okay. This uh, the first part was okay. Just this slide. Ah, uh, this. Okay. So about yeah, this was this was fine. The next slide. You can uh, start from the next slide. This one, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So, uh, <clears throat> as we see about her. spiritual journey that is connected with the social activism and so her spiritual journey after her parents death in the 18 uh, 84 famine uh, uh, she wants to she went to calcutta in 1874 the titles pandita and saraswati were bestowed bestowed on her as acknowledgement of her learning she joined the Brahmo Samaj Reform Reformist Hindu Association through the influence uh, through the uh, influence of Nehemia Gaur Jorge's apologetic writings she became intellectually convinced that whatever was true in the Brahmo Samaj was really uh, or actually Christian in origin and in 18 83 during a visit to england she was baptized in the chapel of the anglican community of st mary the version of bantag england some of the host members she had met in pune pune she was in the europe to pursue a medical degree which in the end her deafness uh, deafness made impossible from 1883 to 1886 ramabai was in the formal sense an anglo catholic lecturing and studying social reform and education in 1887 she published her first english book the hindu caste hindu women a merseyless 
and uh, and the indictment of hindu india's treatment of its women which was persuasive because it was written from the inside two years later she returned to india and with american support opened a non proselytizing institute for the education of young hindu widows this was the sarda sadan a board of wisdom in bombay it should move to pune the more famous of mukti salvation opened at kadgaon in 1898 in the uh, meantime ramabai herself had passed through a second conversion this time an evangelical evangelical one and for the remainder of her life her christianity was close to the catholic holiness patron a pentecostal style revival began at mukti bible translation because her health was poor the running of mukti was left mainly to others she was a woman with a vision and her spiritual growth is such that the became a for, foreigner of women's rights she converted to christianity because of jesus and she discovered her best liberator yes Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Okay, um, so we have Rin um, Ravli and Shiv Kumar left. I don't think Sean is on the call, right? So Rin Ravli or Shiv Kumar, if any of you are ready, uh, just let me know and one of you can go ahead. Can I present, Madam, now? Uh, yes, sure. Awesome, I'm ready. Shall I present now? Okay. Uh, shall we uh, go ahead with Shiv Kumar Rin, and then you can present uh, once Shiv Kumar is done. Okay, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. Ma'am, can you able to hear me? Uh, yes, you're able to hear. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. <coughs> Today, I'm going to present on Mr. John Hyde. Uh, his famous saying is, give me soul so God or I die. And some refer to him as a man who never sleeps. Some refer, refer to him as the apostle of prayer. But more familiarly, he is known as Praying Guide. This is his picture. About his early life, he was born on 9th November 19, uh, 1865 at Carleton, Illinois, USA. His father's uh, name was... Sorry, Tatu. Shiv Kumar, uh, it's not on presenter view. Would you like to switch to presenter? Uh, I mean, to switch to a full screen presentation? So we're able to see all your slides. If you're able to uh, also switch on your video, uh, would you do that as well, please? Oh, no. Is it okay now, madam? Hello. Sorry, sir. Yes, it's fine now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to present on John Hyde, the Apostle of Prayer. His famous saying is, give me soul, so God, or I die. Some refer to him as a man who never sleeps. Some refer to him as the 
apostle of prayer but more familiarly is known as praying guide this is his picture is about his early life he was born on 9th november 1865 at carrollton illinois united states of america his father name was dr smith harris said and mother name was unice his father was a presbyterian minister who proclaimed the gospel message and called for the lord to trust out laborers into his harvest he preached this not only at pulpit but even at the family altar this made a permanent impression on young hyde hyde graduated from carthage college in 1887 and immediately appointed as a teaching uh, teaching faculty in the same college however he had a divine call to the regions beyond so he resigned his faculty position and joined mccormick theological seminary college in chicago about his spiritual journey john early felt the led of god to become a pastor as his father and his oldest brother edmund who was preparing to be a pastor and was a volunteer for the foreign field died of mountain fever while he was still in the seminary college this incident deeply affected him and he wondered if god might be calling him to fill the gap in foreign service left by the passing of his brother during his seminary college days hyde began to pray for others to go out as a foreign missionaries he personally shared his burden for the lost in other nations to the 46 graduating men by the end of graduation time out of this 46 26 people surrendered themselves for the foreign missions during his final years in seminary college a special meeting concerning foreign mission was held as the missionary john herrick from india spoke john became restless after one service he went to his roommate and said give me all the arguments for the foreign field his friend replied arguments are not what you need what you need to do is to go to your room get on your knees and stay there until it is settled with god john decided to take this advice and prayed all night long for the first time the next day he told his friend it is settled i am going to india about his missionary journey uh, john graduated uh, from a seminary college a seminary college in 1892 and he sailed with a group of missionaries to india on october 15 1892 from new york when john arrived in india he was assigned to the punjab region at first he was not a remarkable missionary he was slow of speech his hearing was slightly defective since he lacked in ability he came to the place that he used prayer as his greatest weapon his first assignment was the usual language study at first he went to work on this but later concentrated on bible study he was reprimanded by the committee but he replied first things first he argued that he had come to india to teach the bible and he need to and he needed to know it before he could teach it and god by his spirit wonderfully opened up the scriptures to him simultaneously he did not neglect his language study he became a correct and easy speaker of urdu punjabi english but about that he learned the language of heaven and so learned to speak that he held hundreds of indian artisans spellbound while he opened to them the truths of god's word for 8 years Uh, uh for 8 years he labored without any results as he found the people very unreceptive to the gospel gospel it seemed that no matter how hard he worked no matter how many people he witnessed to nothing happened he finally decided to pray and fast until there was a revival preceding the revival was the organization of punjab prayer union john hyde was associated with this prayer union from its beginning the Punjab prayer union members felt the need for a yearly meeting for bible study and prayer where the spiritual life of the workers pastors teachers and evangelists both foreign and native could be deepened sialkot was the place selected for the annual meeting this sialkot city was in india at that time but now it is in the borders of pakistan it was instrumental in establishing the annual sialkot conferences from which thousands of missionaries and native workers returned to their stations with new power for the work of reaching india with the gospel 
The Seattle Court revival was not an accident, nor an unsought breeze from the heaven. Before one of the first conventions, Hyde, Patterson, and Turner waited and tarried one whole month before the opening day. For 30 days and 30 nights, this godly man waited before God in prayer. At one time during those 30 days, Hyde spent 36 continuous hours on his knees begging God for his power. It was not long after those 30 days before his prayers began to have their desired effect. God began to answer his prayers. In 1908, he was led to claim that God would give him one soul saved each day for one year. He prayed that God would give him not only a soul saved, but that he would baptize at least one convert each day as well. This seemed impossible in India at that time, but after one year, he had personally baptized more than 400 of his own converts. Even though he would win one or two souls each day, he had a great longing and passion for more and more lost souls to know Christ as Savior. The next year, he prayed for two souls a day, and at the end of the year, over 800 precious souls had received Christ as Savior and followed the Lord in believers' baptism through his personal soul winning in that year. In 1910, he asked God for four souls a day, so he went after converts in faith. God wonderfully enlarged his field of service. During the year, he traveled all over India and baptized over 1,600 of his own converts that year. About his last days, at the uh, close of 1910 Seattle Court uh, Convention, he had been called to Calcutta for a revival. He was very sick there and went to a doctor. The doctor advised him to rest as his heart has shifted out of its natural position on the left side and leaning towards the right side. This is called as dextrocardia. But he continued his intercession. On March 11, uh, 1911, uh, praying hide, India's labors were over and as a dying man, he sailed to his home by way of England. In April uh, 1911, he joined evangelist John Wilbur Champion in an evangelic visit to three towns in England. Thereafter, he went home to Northampton, where a malignant brain tumor was discovered, and he died thereafter, and he died there after an operation on February 17, 1912. His last words were in Urdu, Bol Esu Masiki Jai. That means shout the victory of Jesus. He was buried in his family plot in Moss Ridge Cemetery in Carthage. The conclusion is his ministry of prayer in India for almost 20 years was a well known that the natives referred to him as the man who never sleeps, but familiarly he known as the praying guide. His life of sacrifice, humility, love for souls, and deep spirituality, as well as his example in the missionary of intercession, inspired many to follow his example in their own lives and ministry. Though he finished his journey, he still lives through the beautiful story of his life. Its lesson can be briefly stated that prayer is primary, other work is secondary. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv Kumar. Um, if you all are able to stay for a few more minutes, then we can uh, have Rin present as well. Is everyone able to stay for a few more minutes? Pastor, can you hear me? Yes. So I will present it now. This is not working. Thing is not opened. Wait, wait, wait. Let's... Okay. 
and I will try to share it. Okay. So, Pastor, can I start? Yes, we can. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll start. Where you lead me, I will follow. What you feed me, I will swallow. Seeing the starving children, uh, seeing the starving children of India and the worst famine, seeing the dying Indians and smelling the unpleasant smells in the market of Velour. I did decided that she would never come to live in India again. Today, I would like to talk to you, present to you about um, Ida Scudder. Um, she um, is a perfect example of one who laid down her life to follow Christ. Ida was, Scudder was born in 1870 in Ranipet of India, where her mom and dad were medical missionaries to India. Her grandfather, Dr. John Scudder, he was the first medical missionary to India. And um, her father also followed, followed the footsteps of his father as well. And, um, and the thing is, Ida Scudder's family, most of them were um, missionaries, medical missionaries to India. And they had served as medical missionaries in South India for more than a thousand years and um, where uh, 42 members of the family um, worked as medical missionaries and um, yeah, yeah. And Ida Scully was sure that she would never, uh, never follow the footsteps of her father, but until one incident that happened, she, um, um, due to the illness of her, uh, of her mother she had to come back from the u.s to india to help her family and uh, one night as she was writing a letter to um, her friend back at um, america um, there was a knock at the door and there stood a brahmin man who asked i did to come and help his um wife who was um dying trying to give um, birth to a child and either responded that she could not help as uh, she did not have any experience neither did she know anything about it but the brahmin pleaded even the more and then she uh, uh, she told him that she uh, her father could help her uh, help him um, with his uh, wife but then he uh, responded that a man could not see his wife then because she would be be fouled. And after that, um, after that, um, um, a Muslim man uh, approached um, her door and then she, uh, he asked her to also come and help his wife who was struggling to give birth to a child. And she responded the same that she did not know anything about um, giving birth to babies and she did not uh, have any skills to do it. And uh, she referred to her father again, but then he responded that um, that uh, his wife could not see any uh, other man except of his own family. And for the third time the same night, Ida encountered a Hindu man here. And uh, also, again, he asked her to come and help his wife who was sick, trying to give birth to a child. And Ida obviously said the same thing again, that she could not help. She had no experience. She had no skills. And Ida, um, that later that night, Ida, sorry. Yeah. Later, later that night, Ida thought to herself what she could have done or said to change the situation. And, um, but nothing came to her mind. Ida did not like the religious practices that were being um, practiced in India. And she knew that her father could not do anything about it because he was a man. And um, so he could not do anything about this situation. But she knew. She came to this realization that she could help. She could do something for these women in India. So she decided then and there that she would go to 
uh, America should go back to the U.S. and study medicine and come help the uh, come help the women and the babies here in India. And I just um, why is not shifting. And I just studied in the Women's Medical College in Pennsylvania. And uh, there she studied for four years. And then she went to this Cornell Medical College, uh, where uh, this college was one of the top most prestigious colleges in America. And she attended there with the accepted women, and. Um, which is a great honor actually. And she finished it and she came out in flying colors, although sometimes it was really hard for her. And uh, I just got was now an official doctor. Um, but she needed the money to go to hospital in India. She had to raise funds for it. And in the process of doing it, she did not give up, although it was really hard. And she trusted that God would provide and he certainly did for her. She was a woman who lived by faith. And I just got her built a 40 bed hospital in Bellur, India. Just within a few months of her arrival in India, Ida's father died, leaving her uh, feeling helpless because she wanted to learn from someone who was trained, who was older. And uh, in some cases, so after she took over, um, after her dad died, um, she um, so that in some cases she did not feel uh, that she was experienced enough but then um, she attempted some and it was successful and she um, and uh, that helped her to gain the confidence to keep on trying and I discovered had an inspiration to reach out to the villages or the people so he she hitched up the va uh, wagon and uh, she went out to the people because she said if they don't come to me I will go to them because uh, some of them were afraid of her some of them thought she's not qualified enough or some of the people uh, they were like it's too far for them to come all the way to the hospital so she went out to them and uh, so she went out into the dustiest and the dirtiest villages that she could find there in India. And she had a dream to start a nursing school to train young Indian women. She went to the United States to raise funds for this project and God again provided for her. She had a determination to make a difference in the lives of the Indian women in India through this project. And many, uh, many people came alongside Ida Scudder to make her dream a reality. 14 women were selected in her school and through all their efforts, Ida School became the top medical school in the district. In the 25 years of serving as a doctor in India, Ida Scudder had a medical school, a nursing school and a large hospital. But she wondered what the next challenge would be, knowing that there was still so much more to be done. During this time, World War II was, was going on and there, were, there was Great Depression happening in the United, United States. So Ida was running short of the donations uh, to run her hospital. Even in the midst of it all, Ida did not give up, but went on to the United States to raise funds for the work in Belo. And she did raise some and then she came back to India to help. And uh, finally in... Um, Finally, in uh, 1946, when Ida was um, 75 years old, passed beyond uh, her time to work, she finally announced to retire from her work. And, and following that year, on August 15, 1947, India became an independent nation, and the new government showed just how much progress Indian women had made, in, uh, made since in Ida had arrived back in the country. For good, at the, for good at the turn of the century. A woman was appointed Minister of Health and another the govern, governor of West Bengal province. So Ida was glad to see that she wanted women to have a higher place in society because they were always looked down. And um, she then moved to the bungalow that she had built in Kodai Kanal. She had many visitors and she can also continue to visit Valor where she saw many new developments and changes taking place uh, in the hospital that she started. And at the age of 90 in 1960, I discovered died peacefully at her, uh, at her bungalow home in India. This was said at the funeral. 
Only those who can see the invisible can achieve the impossible. Dr. Ida Scudder has achieved the impossible through her close touch with the invisible God through her faith. And in 19, so here, this is a map where it shows uh, where, uh, I mean, we can see in Tamil Nadu, uh, where CMC Valor. Uh, so this is the, um, this Christ, Christian Medical College that I just kind of founded, and it was in 1902. And uh, so, and um, she left a living legacy. She, um, um, serving for nearly 60 years, Dr. Ida Scudder lived out the truth and compassion found in Christ. She pioneered a first-rate medical hospital, brought life-saving health care. Oh, my laptop shut down. My charge. Let's see. Sorry, I, continue. I, need, I need the word. Past. Where are you going? So, um, um, she and and then she left a uh, an inspiring uh, legacy that still touches millions of people with healing and hope. She always said that there was something more to do. She never sat idly. She lived the gospel, and people's lives were touched and transformed because of her love and care. Ida Scudder saw a need and found a need and found a solution for it. She changed an entire community and later on the whole nation. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rin. Um, thank you all, you know, uh, dealing with technology and uh, trying to figure out how to manage everything all of a sudden because it was unexpected that we were having an online class. Um, it was a little bit challenging. Thank you for presenting. Um, so we will meet next week. We are off on Monday, but we'll meet on Tuesday next week and continue from where we start. Thank you. Um, I think my presentation will be next week, right? On Tuesday.